democracy and elections. New Mexico Listens is a collaborative project of the League of Women Voters of New Mexico and the New Mexico Humanities Council, supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities Initiative, a more perfect union. The Humanities Council will be posting the recording of this session on its website. I want to thank Bethany Tabor, our young, talented, and committed program officer for her work on New Mexico Listens, including handling the technical logistics of this program. I'm Meredith Machen, a retired educator and policy advocate, education co-chair for the League and project director. Um, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization which works to protect and expand voting rights and strengthen democracy. We want everyone, young and old, citizen and non-citizen, to have the confidence, knowledge, and skills to participate through the year, not just in election time, in whatever way they can. It's not just about voting. Our increasingly fragile democracy depends on each and every one of us caring about what happens in our schools, communities, and workplaces. Over the past few years, most of us have acknowledged that uh, we're sticking mostly to our own circles. We're less likely to talk with others with different perspectives and to listen deeply about their concerns, values, hopes, and dreams. This was exacerbated with the pandemic, of course, but it started years before 2020 and our isolation seems to have gotten worse. Uh, people are crying for change and there's widespread recognition across the country that much of what is happening is unhealthy for democracy. There's widespread consensus that we must work to reduce violence, guns, crime, racism, substance abuse, pollution, global warming, scarcity of clean water, hunger, homelessness, and poverty. That if we are to be the land of opportunity, the home of the free and the brave, we need to strengthen civil rights protections, the availability of affordable health care, provide safety nets for vulnerable populations so that they can survive. We need access to quality education in order to have a strong economy and a country we're proud of. We're not going to talk about all of these things today, of course, but they're in the background as we think about who we are what we need our elected officials to care about, how we uh, think about our foreign policy, border issues, policies for refugees, humanitarian needs, inflation. It's sometimes overwhelming, but our panelists today are gonna share their perspectives on some of these issues and others. And we hope that this discussion will enlighten and inspire us to work together for a more perfect union. Democracy is messy and complex, but most of us would not trade it for any other form of government. We have a diverse group of panelists. I'm going to say um, a little bit about each of them, but I'm hoping they will amplify and tell us more about what they do after I uh, introduce them. Cindy Nava is the Executive Director of Transform Education New Mexico. Cindy's a policy, public policy advocate and educator dedicated to empowering youth through leadership development. She brings an immigrant lens to her lifelong commitment to advance equity and opportunity. After residing in New Mexico for 26 years, Cindy became a US citizen in 2021 and voted for the first time. Regis Pecos, Cochiti, Pueblo of Cochiti, is trustee emeritus of Princeton University, the first Native American to serve on the board of trustees of Princeton, his alma mater. His leadership experience and policy expertise extend across national, regional, state, and tribal governments. Until 2021, he directed our state majority office, chief of staff, and he was director of policy and legislative affairs. And Regis continues to serve on several boards and advocacy committees. He co-directs the Leadership Institute at Santa Fe Indian School, which he co-founded. Dr. Finney Coleman 
teaches American and African American literature, history, and culture at UNM and serves as president of Faculty Senate. For more than 20 years, he has worked as a higher education consultant specializing in diversity, equity, and inclusion on college campuses. Prior to his career in academia, uh, Finney served as an Army intelligence officer around the globe. Dr. Elaine Rodriguez chairs the History and Political Science Department of Highlands University, where she teaches American government, Southwest history and culture. Her politics, uh, her research and experience ranges from the impact of the National Voter Registration Act to Latino politics and culture. She brings new perspectives on a sustainable uh, economic growth, youth leadership, and civic engagement through her recent service on the City Council of Las Vegas, New Mexico. Um, so before, before we begin, I just wanna say a little bit more about elections. Studies galore have proven that our elections are safe and secure, yet flimsy claims of voter fraud are being used to pass laws that suppress the vote. In some states, election workers and voters have been threatened. Big money is controlling candidates. Panelists, what can we the people do to counteract the negative trends in our country? and strengthen trust in each other and our institutions. So that's your first question. And I'd like you each, as you try to answer that huge question, we have lots of huge questions today, to say a little bit more about your work and how your work, um, plays into strengthening trust in one another and our institutions. Thank you. Meredith, do you want us just to jump in or do you want to- Sure, sure, us? sure. Whoever wants to jump in first. Uh-huh, okay. sure. I'll go ahead and start, how's that? Um, Great. I've been in the education IQ for 40 plus years. And I've worked at different universities with um, different types of students. And also being on the city council, um, I really have probably gained a better understanding of, you know, wh where the uh, kind of the average citizen sets on a lot of elections and public policy and their elected officials. And I've kind of discovered, and it's probably nothing new that we don't already know, right? Um, our electoral system is probably one of the most complicated systems um, in understanding, you know, how to um, and we have a lot of different procedures. And this late, latest election was much more complicated because we did redistricting. Um, so many um, citizens who were in one district were changed and now they're in new districts um, for the city, city wards, the school boards and state legislature elections that are going to be coming up. And what I've really discovered is one is, um, and I kind of have moved away because I came up in through a traditional discipline, political science, right? That's dominated uh, by white males. Um, and they define the rules um, to how we get tenure. Um, that has changed over time, but a lot of it you publish, you publish a book, you publish in the top tier journals. And I did that. And when I went back to my community and, you know, talked about that, you know, they said, well, what, how does that help our community? You know, you publishing in a political science journal that only maybe 2% of political scientists read, 
How does that help our community? So I really changed my perspective of, you know, moving away from, you know, uh, I do research, but now I engage my students. My students are the ones who determine what areas we're going to research. Um, they determine, you know, what are the major issues in their community, and we work to research that. And then they report to the city council or to the state legislature their findings. Excellent. Um, yeah. The other thing that I thought was very important is and we're in the process of doing right now, we're doing a couple of things. One is, you know, city council, and we all know this, any elected official, you know, you get campaign funds, you kind of respond to the loudest people or the most squeaky will. And I noticed that a lot of our Hispanic um, residents would never complain. They never complain, you know, um, so, I worked a lot on the area that was the most neglected and brought a lot of the budget to that area, but I didn't get reelected and it gave me some insight to how elections are operated today. However, I told him it doesn't stop there. We create a council now. We create a community council that we meet and then you take these issues um, to the city council, but it always requires follow-up. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. That really yes. helps. And we come back to your students and action research and service. And uh, it's so important. You're talking my, <laughs> exactly what I've always insisted uh, is that the, the importance of educators is to make a difference in the community and um, absolutely. Um, who wants to jump in? Cindy, you want to take a take yes, a chance uh, here? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Machen. Um, hello, everyone. First of all, just thank you for joining. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. I know I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, Buenas tardes, and thank you for sharing your a bit of your Sunday with us. Um, I know it's not necessarily the easiest thing, but I think the conversation is important. And thank you for the invitation, Bethany and Dr. Machen. Um, it's really great uh, to be here with you all. Uh, I'm Cindy Nava. Again, I think I know a whole lot of you. So I am, I'm an immigrant, uh, was brought here as a kid, seven years old, uh, from Chihuahua, Mexico. And essentially, you know, I know nothing, I grew up to know nothing beyond New Mexico because of the very restricted life that I had to go through. I ended up doing policy and politics and then nonprofit leadership. Um, and everything has certainly aligned, but I think it's tr it's absolutely been because of so many of you opening doors for so many folks like myself. Um, but in the world of, of advocacy and policy, uh, especially when you talk about voting and being someone who never had the privilege to vote, um, until one year ago today, well, not today, uh, in February of this year, uh, I was able to cast the first vote of my life last year. Um, and that was transformational beyond measure. And I can't reiterate the importance of what that means, but I would be remiss to, to, to not mention that as an immigrant and as immigrant communities, um, those communities hold a lot of power and casting a vote is not the only way for them to be engaged um, because I did it for over 15 years. Um, you know, a million unpaid internships, a million uh, engagement uh, forms that I, that, I, that I was able to be part of. Um, but it was because of those support systems, and many of you are actually in this in the Zoom meeting um, that allowed for that those things to happen. And I would I know the question was um, what can we do to to counteract negative trends in the country? And as someone who has lived my entire life counteracting every single thing that I've had to go through. Um, I can tell you that those things aren't easy, and especially when you live in fear, it makes things 10 times harder. But if you are one who can lend a hand, if you are a person who has some sort of access uh, and you know can have that sit down and that opportunity to, to extend you know, support systems, those things change lives. And individuals changed my life through that, through uh, you know, providing access um, and then getting to work and, and a whole lot of 
of campaigns uh, with really great candidates and a lot of great folks, both in the nonprofit and in the policy and political area. Um, those things have changed not only access, but they've also allowed me a space to speak and to tell my story, which can be the most frightening thing to do, especially when you're undocumented. Um, so I would say counteracting things by being positive and by providing access and providing opportunities is the way to go, um, regardless of what space we are, um, you know, where we lead in or we are part of. I think every single one of us has the, the capacity and the ability to open just to, open up the ability to even listen to others and listen to their stories because the fear is there um, for one thing or another. But I think if we continue to do that and if we continue to collaborate and really work together, I think that's how we continue shifting and changing minds, um, not only at a state level, but at a, at a national level. And thank you for having me here once again. Excellent, thank you so much. Regis, would you like to go? Sure, thank you. And, and foremost, my appreciation for the invitation to um, be part of this discussion today. And I think uh, one of the things missing in the fulfillment of our collective desire to, um, to contribute in fulfilling uh, the vision of this nation um, is the diminished um, trust and confidence uh, in, in, in the multitude of relationships that are necessary to make democracy work. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Coche de Pueblo, uh, went to Bernalillo Public Schools, um, proud of that. Um, but I think an important context for me to share with all of you um, is that one of my first uh, major um, uh, heartbreaks and encounter was the construction of the largest man-made lakes in the world uh, on our homelands in Cochiti uh, that resulted in the destruction of some of the most holiest and revered places of worship. But in the mix of, of that experience is something that I learned from my grandfather who was blind for most of his life. And at a very critical point as I became the spokesperson for the tribal council uh, during litigation, during all of the work to uh, fulfill a three-part settlement. One of the most painful aspects was the um, engagement with uh, the Corps of Engineers that really represented the power and the institutional racism um, at, uh, epitomizing all of the worst. and and pained as I was in their treatment of the elders that I revered in Cochiti, went to my father, my father took me to my grandfather. And he, my father asked me to describe my feeling um, and the beginnings of feeling uh, a, a very deep deepening anger towards the arrogance and paternalism in the treatment of the federal government towards uh, our people. And my grandfather told me that really changed my life. And he shared with me is that everything that I saw ugly about uh, that treatment, everything that, that resulted in pain coming from that kind of treatment, my grandfather told me, if that is something that deeply pains you, if that is what angers you, then that is what you don't want to become. And be mindful, son, that you will be engaged in this kind of experience for the rest of your life in the work that, that I pray that you will do for your people. And he said, when you open your mind and you open your heart in these relationships, always be mindful that the people that you perceive to be your enemies, in fact, in reality, he said, will become your greater, greatest teachers of compassion. And wow. so that was really um, something deeply embedded in my mind and, and in my heart that as I pursued my work in, in public uh, at the tribal level, 
uh, at the state level, at the federal level, building trust and building confidence uh, with those things that contributed in building a common agenda. I came into state government when there was no policy, no laws that define the relationship between the sovereign nations of New Mexico and the state of New Mexico. And so all of my lifetime work has really come from that single teaching that really engaged me in some of the most complex areas of intergovernmental relations. But that has always been at the heart of the approach in everything that I do, always with a sense of optimism, because in the most complex areas, whether it was about protecting water or land or our way of life, our cultural resources, language or culture, it always was something that resulted in a reality that ultimately became a bipartisan approach. And so that really defines my optimism that even as ugly as this world can get, we can never give up working towards a spirit of cooperation and collaboration and it's a difficult road to travel when you're marginalized, super marginalized as indigenous peoples are. But the work must continue. And in my lifetime of work, I found ways to build trust and confidence to be at the heart of building a common agenda and building relationships to, to reach the kind of desired outcomes that come from mutual uh, respect and mutual articulation of the things that we desire for our children or grandchildren for all people. And so uh, just want to provide that context as yeah, difficult as yeah. things have been, uh, that has been central. And I think that's a very important part in our collective work moving forward. Thank you. Right, right, exactly. I mean, the anger, you know, is the motivator, but you can't stay in that yes uh finney you have so much to contribute i i think you're still muted i i am um it's always good to participate in these types of forums and it seems i, I have a habit of following right behind regis that's always a tough, <laughs> uh, <laughs> tough thing to to do um you know, I think as I was listening to my colleagues' responses and and thinking about, you know, how to respond, you know, with intellectual honesty about the question that you ask, um, you know, the, the, there, there are some fundamental truths that I think I see um, at work um, that really are informing our politics today in the United States. And some of it has to do with remarkable intellectual dishonesty, um, the inability to to um, embrace the truth as something that is uh, factual as opposed to something that is partisan. So that if you have a position or you have a reasoned position that somehow it doesn't matter that the position itself is rooted in fact, it is somehow seen as being left or right, Democrat or Republican. Our forum today, of course, is a nonpartisan forum and the idea is to, t to discuss the problems that we face um, as, a, as a nation and how do we rebuild the trust that has eroded. And I think that begins with being brutally honest about the truths that le have led us to this moment and not sugarcoating it and not backing away from it because we're afraid somehow that uh, one political party on the left or the right might disagree or agree too much with what it is that we have to say. There's some things that are true just because they are true, you know? And until we can, you know, make it safe for us to have ideas and to express those ideas without being lumped into categories, uh, and that's where we're headed, that any utterance is seen as somehow uh, a sign of your political alignment. Um, gone are the days when uh, liberals on both parties could come together to talk about issues or conservatives from both parties might come together to discuss platforms. Now we have rooted in our country, and this begins in the 1948 election, 
Um, and you know, and unfortunately, few so very few of us know what happened in the 48, 1948 election and the nineteen sixty eight election that are simply maturing in our historic moment. Um, and in nineteen forty eight, we saw the galvanization of our politics along ideological lines as opposed to platforms. So that if you were in this particular party, every position that you held had to be either liberal or conservative. And I think that kind of dumbing down of American politics. Um, is at the root of where we are today. So that it's very difficult to have discussions about issues when they're rooted in ideology as opposed to fact. So, I mean, I have a lot more to say there, a whole long lecture about, you know, that shift. And we saw that shift from 1948, African-Americans uh, voted largely um, Republican. And from 1948 to 1968, overwhelmingly Democrat. And very few of us um, have taken the time to figure out why is that so? Why have we had that kind of balkanization in American politics? And without that intellectual curiosity, I think we're in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope we can come back to uh, the social studies standards and civics education. Um, and because, you know, I think we have a lot to be proud of in this state uh, and uh, when we think about what's happening in a lot of states where these discussions are not being allowed in the schools. Uh, so I think you've touched on a lot of very, very important topics here. And all of you, I, I so appreciate your, your candor and um, your perspectives and, and uh, look forward to your hearing more. Um, May how I follow up on that? Yeah, please. And pose a question to the group, if you wouldn't mind. Um, no, please. That's very interesting, um, Dr. Coleman, because we're seeing that kind of that same trend uh, with the Hispanic voters also, kind of uh, a moving away, you know, from the kind of liberal support of the Democrats, um, the Democratic Party now to more of a conservative and support for Trump um, and Republicans in that regard. And that was a issue that my students and I really explored. And uh, the reasons as to why we're seeing kind of this movement, um, you know, not in large numbers, but there is a, a movement and an increase. And more so in like, if you look at Northern New Mexico, you know, Northern New Mexico was always seen as the stronghold for the Democratic Party. You know, very rarely did a, a Republican candidate get more than, you know, 20% of the vote. And now we're seeing that increasing, you know, to 30, 33, 37% um, of the vote. We're also seeing that in Florida, where Florida, is an interesting dichotomy, right? Because you have the, the Cuban population that, you know, has been very supportive of the Republican party. Um, but my question to you, and I, I often think about this in the classroom because I came through education during um, the uh, 70s. So I was very much involved in the movements, um, the Chicano movements. Um, in Colorado and my friends were very much involved in the movements and the social movements, you know, um, we had a lot of nonprofits and I'm not wanting to take uh, credit away from nonprofits that worked, but they work within the structure of an institution defined by, um, you know, administration. Um, but movements work outside the structure and they make a lot of difference. And, you know, the movements of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s uh, with the civil rights movement, uh, the Chicano movement, the Pan American movement, the women's movement, we had some very viable movements that forced these institutions to change. And we no longer have that. We have movements, you know, but they don't sustain themselves over time not like those movements. My question to you is, is it the lack of movements that really haven't forced administrations 
to move and create more equitable um, equity for our communities. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to way I know everyone else will want to to answer that too. Um, you know, at, from a just from a historical lens, um, the, the problem with movements that we've had in the past is the paradox of equity and freedom, the notions of those being goals that we were after, and equity um, and freedom are both very traditionally liberal concepts. And since we ideologically imagine that liberalism is somehow equated with freedom, um, we forget that we're talking about constructing movements for something that was never um, a constant. I'll, I'll be a bit more specific. So what freedom meant for black women in the 1970s wasn't the same thing that freedom meant for white women in the early 1970s. And then we were surprised and shocked that the movements of the early 1970s didn't produce the kind of equity that we thought we wanted to, to have across the country. That had more to do with what the movement was after and the dominant gaze that guided the movement. The same thing was true of the civil rights movement, right? Um, that we were seeking equity in a community that was never going to uh, concede equity. Um, the concession might be inclusion, right? We might see more opportunities, but the wholesale notion of equity is not one that has ever been um, embraced by mainstream America, ever. It has just not been part of who we are and what we do as a nation. And so it is an unrealistic expect expectation um, to imagine that a movement that doesn't even have the fundamental ideas, constants about that, would somehow come up with outcomes that would be constant and fair. No, black women, for example, um, had been working in the house, working outside of the household for centuries in someone else's household. The idea that a key tenant or a platform for those uh, women that it would be to work on the outside, we've been doing that for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, right? It's a very different need that black women had um, at that moment than from what middle, middle class white women had. And so when the dominant gaze becomes the center, centered gaze, then that's what we have. We see this kind of disjuncture. And it's far more complex than that. I mean, you could spend a semester talking about, right. about that. <laughs> yes, we could. We could. Um, I think we have made some advances in equity, but, you know, we're seeing a time right now where there's real pushback even to that word, to that concept. And yet, uh, you know, we, the people, when you look at the Constitution, I mean, we know that only white property owners, males, were allowed to vote. Uh, we look at, you know, the advances that women have had over the years, uh, and they've helped promote in society, partially because they got the vote. Uh, but yes, we are seeing um, an amazing backlash to I think some of the progress that we seem to have made in earlier movements, and I think you know we could go on and, and talk about that. Uh, Cindy and uh, Regis, do you want to weigh in on that, or you want to uh, move on to another topic? I'm okay with moving on. Okay. okay. You know, I just want to add to what what Phoenix shared, and you know, for Indigenous peoples you know the, the movements are are shifting in ways that are driven by immediate threats to um major um issues with land and the threats to destruction of of sacred sites and resources and while those movements are are immediate you know, it, it takes away from the shift of another kind of the movements about equity and justice and, and, and those issues, not to say that they have been diminished, but the fights are on multiple fronts um, that is really resulting in a different uh, framing of the definitions from the past uh, with regard to movements uh our response to these immediate kinds of threats 
is changing the whole paradigm in the way that we define um, the way that people are engaging um, in, in pushing back on the threats to the very survival. It's a very different kind of approach from what the fights were and the movements in the, in the, in the 60s uh, to what we now know them. And labels are probably uh, used in ways uh, that when we look further uh, and deeper into the kind of definitions uh, that we're using, it almost um, is, is, is not fitting for the ways in which we're getting forced to respond to the multitude of challenges to um, just survival uh, for, for, for people of color. Thank you. And can I, can I just say one more thing, Meredith, in that regard? Sure. Um, you know, I would encourage us to, um, to develop a more sophisticated vocabulary about these terms. Um, if I give my son an apple and I give my daughter half of an apple and my daughter turns to me and says, this is not equitable, right? Um, the only place, the only way that I reach equity is when both of those children have an apple. I can't give my son three quarters of, or my daughter three quarters of an apple and call that equitable or progress. Yes, you're getting more of a, a you're, you're getting more apple than you had in the past, but it is still not equitable. I want us to right. imagine and think about equity as a binary as opposed to something that's um, progressive. We might have, we might look at, you know, progressivism um, in terms of um, inclusion, more inclusion than in the past. I, I, I see that. But when we start talking about fundamental notions of equity, equitable, there, there, we, we don't advance in equity, we achieve equity. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, uh, my daughter's 37. And she and um, a lot of her friends, and I hear this a lot from Gen Z as well as millennials are saying, you know, it's the parties that have destroyed things and we've got to move away from the duopoly. Uh, and, you know, we a lot more young people are registering as decline to state or, you know, independence. And uh, we've opened up the primaries a little teeny bit this in New Mexico. But um yeah, I'm wondering, uh, you know, is that the answer to move away from some of the party rhetoric that helps to polarize some of the attitudes? Um, uh, and, and what do you think about opening the primaries more and getting away from the influence of the parties? Well, Meredith, to follow up with um, Dr. Coleman, it's really teaching a whole generation. Um, you know, the millennials, because um, I work with a lot of the millennials and many of them don't even have a, a understanding of the social movements. Many of them don't really have a good understanding of the history, the social movements and the cause. Um, and, and it's teaching a whole generation. So now, you know, I work with my grandchildren and as um, Dr. Coleman said, you know, it's teaching equity. You know, my son doesn't get to, uh, my grandson doesn't get the whole apple. My granddaughters only get half the apple. You know, it's really like teaching equity and getting them to understand equity. So as they grow up, they instill that in their friends, their cousins, their community. So it really does take an, another generation or two generations to move beyond these barriers. Yes, yes. Um, I saw Doris Page um, say an important distinction. Uh, let's see, uh, where is it? Something about uh, wealth gaps are widening as the opportunity for home ownership or diminishing. Witness the percentage of homes today being purchased by corporations and hedge funds resulting in cities of renters. As renters, there's a tendency to be less engaged on the local level on issues that impact the quality of life, education, recreation facilities, public safety, and voting. Um, yes, you know, I think you know, if you look at the wealth gap, 
um, you know, in our country. We know that the, you know, Wall Street has been very, very, very good to a lot of its investors, although there are corrections always. Um, and, and most uh, Americans do not have, you know, the capacity to invest. I mean, now we're seeing a little bit more corporate responsibility saying we're not going to, we're going to divest from organizations that are racist. Um, we want to invest in corporations that are environmentally responsible. But um, we do have a problem with the whole concept of of equity and when the wealth inequality is so threatening to uh, to our democracy, what are some of the things that we can do? And you know, you you always have people who are going to take advantage of what they they feel as kind of weaker individuals, according to how they define. But this whole uh, fire and evacuation has really brought to light. Um, you know, a lot of individuals and attorneys that are coming into our community and are willing to represent these people and they don't have money to pay for lawyers, but they want a percentage of their property. Um, or, you know, you, we ran into issues where people don't have official documentation. I mean, some of these lands have been left to them generationally you know, and it was just passed from one generation to the next. And they don't have a, a lot of the documentation and deeds and titles. And um, it's difficult for them to claim any kind of government subsidies if they don't have the right documentation. So it's kind of regrouping and revisiting kind of um, back into the 1850s, um, 1860s when settlements came in and just took over a lot of these Hispanic um, people people's land and we're seeing it reoccurring now with the fire and you know the lands of these people which is really sad um so that hasn't evolved <laughs> you know i th i think we would all be remiss um you know as we're talking about um our collective history uh to not talk about how education really is at the very heart of the reality and the circumstances that, that we're now challenged with. And the way in which education has been controlled by the elite in this country has resulted in the kind of collective ignorance as a result of the education that has been imposed upon all of us. And mm -hmm. so, the manifestation of education and the marginalization, the lack of, of being engaged in the governance of public schools as an example, has really resulted in massive underachievement of, of not just children of color, but across the board that in states like New Mexico, where you have almost 80% of children that are linguistically and culturally blessed, as we say, all of what defines them that are assets to their identity have always been treated as liabilities in the public school education process and, and systems and institutions. And that kind of failure of the kind of education we have all been subjected to is really leading in the to the manifestation of poverty and hunger and health disparities, and ultimately the, the cycles of violence and the cycles of self-destruction uh, as we see uh, in our case, unfortunately, indigenous young people um, leading nationally with regard to a sense of hopelessness that results in, in suicide. And so as we're dealing with a landmark decision here in New Mexico in the martinez Yazi case, it really is a lesson that, that should open all of our minds that if we don't do things differently, where we're headed is, is unfortunately everything that is a manifestation of the kind of collective failure uh, to transform education in the way that that education can be extended to 
not just certain people who are in control, but unless we do it for all children, we're gonna continue to see the manifestation destroy society uh, and democracy at that, because then it all becomes a part of the reality of those who have and those who don't. And those who have will continue to yield the economic power that results in maintaining economic power that translates into political power at any cost. And if we see the McConnells of the world and the ugliness with which he speaks, um, that should be frightening to all of us because that is the very heart of the destruction in terms of perpetuating those who have and those who don't. And at the center of that equation is, is education and the way that some have the opportunity, but the majority don't, that contributes to the kind of challenges that we now face. Here, Thank here. You. I think the greatest threat that I see, and I know we're all educators here, and maybe I have a slanted perspective, but the, the threat to our democracy by underfunding education, by you know movements to privatize education, uh, to not allow things to be taught or talked about in education. You know, if you look at the founding documents of our, our, our country and most of the constitutions have provisions such as the basis that um, of the Martinez Yazi suit where we have the fundamental right to a free, sufficient, education, non-denominational for all individuals. And so the threat to um, undermining education to me is most fundamental fear I have. Um, Cindy, I know you work Transform Education New Mexico. This is your bailiwick. What do you have to add to that comment? There it is. Thank you. I think just even just listening to the conversation and um, I see sort of two lenses coming through really strongly. Um, clearly on the education side, which is, you know, that's essentially my everyday uh, work um, and working very closely with Regis Pecos um, and many other allies from across the state um, to ensure that we are amplifying um, the findings. And really, I think from the lens of Transform Education New Mexico, to really amplify the voices of the four student groups that were that, that you know are um, really highlighted in the lawsuit as being underserved. So that is students with disabilities, Native American students, English language learners, and um, low income students. And as we know in New Mexico, there's an overlap of that. Um, so really, really focusing on ensuring that we uplift the power of that collective action and what that can become. Um, and as someone who comes from both two of those groups as an English learner and as a low income student, um, you know, I've, I don't only understand it, I've lived it. Um, and then I think you asked about, you know, parties and the engagement, but I think beyond party lines, I think the bottom line is we should be focusing on the necessities and the needs of the communities that we that we represent and that we live within. So in a state like New Mexico, what are the issues that are affecting our communities? Um, because most of the time, the reality is those communities don't have the privilege to sit in a group like us to talk and discuss these things. And my parents would not have the ability to come and sit on a Zoom call because they have to either be working construction or cleaning homes for, for other folks. So I have, I've always reiterated it and said, you know, there's a huge sense of responsibility when we have the ability to sit and discuss these things and have the really a really long extension of our reach to ask those individuals what they absolutely need every day. I mean, what have, what barriers are they are they facing because they don't have the privilege to sit in rooms and, and change policies or you know really collaborate in forms that we have access to. And I know that from just, I mean, you know, from a lived experience that is truly rooted um, in inequity, in lack of access, 
and what it means to go through life without having a social security and what that means in terms of what we can do as a collective. So I think it's incredibly important that we outreach to those communities and that we continue to listen because they're the ones that are faced with those things and they are the experts. They understand it and they are facing those barriers each and every day. So I think paying respect to them and their lived experience is incredibly important. Um, and on the end of equity and education, I mean, it's completely completely tied up. And I believe that we have to listen to those student groups equally in the same format as we need to listen to those same communities to ensure that we listen to their needs and what we can do to see that what we can do as, as collective partners to implement that change each and every day. Thank you. Yes, yes. And um, like a, a question I'd like to pose also to the Committee on Education. Um, uh, I take a group of students, um, it's the New Mexico uh, Leadership Fellowship that we go every year and they engage with the state legislatures and they work on capital outlays to bring money to Highlands. But my question to you, um, and Cindy, you might be able to address this better. And, um, but in looking at the budgets um, that are being allocated to education, over time, I've really seen much more of an increase going to middle administration and top administration and less money going into the classroom, um, into the teachers. I mean, we, we do put money into the classroom and give money to the teachers, but not at the same rate that we increase percentage wise to middle administration and top administration. And not only do we see that at K through 12, but we're also seeing it at the universities. You know, we have a lot of students that um, are computers, you know, and we're in a tech, uh, technology age where students rely on computers. Universities are moving to more online classes, um, but we don't update our computers. Um, we work with a lot of, um, Native Americans and they don't even get access sometimes to the internet and computers. They have to go to a coffee shop or McDonald's to be able to access the internet. So I understand by increasing money and with this, uh, the case of Yahtzee, but we need more accountability and making sure that money's going to the teachers and teachers are still having to pay for supplies. That's ridiculous. Right. Well, I'd like right. your opinion on that or anybody's, I'm curious. So I, I, I have my hand raised up there, but it's a little brown hand. It might not, I might need to change oh. the color of my hand <laughs> up there. Um, I see you, Finney. So I, I, I want to implore this group um, and, and, and all of the people who are, um, who are you know, with us today and, and, and we need to have more conversations like this and reach more people. And I hope, hope we'll have continue to have these kinds of conversations. But I implore you, implore all of us to look at the data. When we, what Yazi Martinez did is it showed um, simply a fundamental truth in, in, in what's happening in education in New Mexico. But there's something else that emerges when you look closely at the data. We, we have the structure in, the United, in, in, in New Mexico in terms of the so-called achievement gap is the same as it is across the nation where students of color are, don't perform as high as you know, white students, et cetera, right? But what's really interesting is as you look at that hierarchy from Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, uh, whites, however we're doing that, and map that onto the national numbers, an interesting uh, dynamic emerges. When you look at the lowest achieving of um, our students in New Mexico, students of color, many of them in terms of groups, they are closer to the national average, even though they are beneath white students in terms of performance, than white students are to the national average. What I'm saying is that the data set shows that it's not just that students of color are being underserved, but all of our students, independent of their race or ethnicity, are being underserved in the state of New Mexico. We need to address the low-hanging fruit. We need to address those issues that are right before our eyes. 
but we must do a better job of looking at what the data is telling us. I've looked at Arizona. Uh, actually, I looked at other states that have a similar similar um, economic profile to the to to New Mexico, right? Oklahoma, Colorado, Nevada, and Arizona kind of creep to the top of that list. And when you look at the, look at the differences between what we're pr providing for our children and what's happening in those other states. Utah in particular is doing an outstanding job in many respects. There's one major glaring difference. Accountability is um, held. Accountability for what happens in the classroom is a function of our electoral system and not an appointment by our, our government. That's the signal difference between us and those other states. It has to do with accountability at the local level. Um, and it's, it is, of course, a resource problem. Um, but we, our profile, our economic profile is close enough that we should be having similar, similar um, outcomes to other states. And we can't blame it on the teachers. Uh, we have great teachers in the state of New Mexico. We have wonderful teachers. There's something else systematically wrong. And our students are no less, pre are no less prepared coming out of the womb to achieve than other students across the state. We have a systematic problem that is more deeply rooted than even what Yazzie Martinez is pointing out. I want to go back to one other point, and it has to do with the generational point. You know, I teach in one classroom. I might have five different generations of Americans in my classroom, from Generation Xers all the way up to baby boomers. And one thing that they all have in common is that they don't know the history, doc, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, that we were talking about earlier. It's true, the millennials don't know a great deal about that history, but the problem is they're not alone. <laughs> the, I don't, the baby boomers don't show me any greater knowledge of that history than do gener Generation X or Generation Y. The truth is we are simply underserving our, our kids, especially in New Mexico, from the, from the womb to, to the to the college classroom. And we have to take a systematic look at the the different places in our pipeline where kids are falling out of it. Our dropout rates are incredible still in this day and age. But there are things that we can do, but it takes a different kind of vision than what we've had so far. It requires a vision that goes back and doesn't blame our teachers for what's going wrong in the classroom, but tries to figure out what is happening systematically um, that's leading to the kinds of outcomes that we see in the state of New Mexico. And I believe we can turn it around. It has to do with accountability. It's not, I don't think it has to do with resources. It's who's accountable for teaching our, 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 our students. You know, one of, one of the most fundamental um, disconnect to everything that Finney is saying, everyone should be appalled on this call and beyond that we have no articulated vision, nor do we have a comprehensive education plan. Imagine that in the last, se last session was the state's unprecedented surplus of revenue. And in this coming session, there will be an equally unprecedented surplus of revenue. But imagine the amounts that are now into the billions of dollars that are being invested is without a comprehensive plan so that the reality that plays out in the legislature where there is no plan articulated Individual legislators then result in pushing their own agenda, but those individual strategic moves of investing millions of dollars are not strategically aligned to any comprehensive plan. And so if there's something that, that we must do is, is really to speak to Finney's point, and, and really demand a comprehensive education plan so that we can hold people accountable, so that we can measure the investments and the outcomes based on the findings in this landmark decision articulated in the development of policy, defining programs and defining new laws to be enacted or amending laws that exist that are aligned with this landmark decision and findings in Yazi Martinez. But 
since 2018, we have yet to see those fundamental connections that then builds upon very strategic investments to measure how we are meeting or whether we are meeting benchmarks that are so fundamental to address the findings in this landmark decision. Thank you. There are Absolutely. This is Elisa. I just, um, uh, Mr. Pickles, yeah, we do have a vision. And Dr. Coleman, our vision is that we think we're New Hampshire. We aren't New Hampshire, we're New Mexico. And we are a minority <laughs> majority state, 70% just Native American and Latinos make up 70% of the school system. Now, if you add Blacks and Asians and all the other minorities, we're probably up to 75, 80% of the population. And so we still pretend like we're somebody else. When are we going to use, and I absolutely agree with you and Dr. Coleman, the thing is that we don't, until we acknowledge who we are, and the needs of our community and where that representation matters. During this last legal, the, the last session when there was all this money, I wrote to several of the legislators and I said, why can't you take a you know, million dollars and buy books, just books that represent who we are, that tell our stories that would fill the classrooms and basically everybody said, oh, well, you know, that's not my issue. I'm, I'm with wildlife and I'm with climate change. These are our leaders. If we had, you know, representation matters. We need to see ourselves. You know, the last time I am 81 years old, the last time I saw myself reflected in the classroom, in a book was in the fourth grade. That was probably down in the 40s sometime. And I never saw one year and then I disappeared and our kids never see themselves in any way, shape or form. That needs to change. Right, That's Elisa, thank you very much. And I know you've served on committees. I think we could, we could spend the rest of this time together on education and I think, you know, our commitment to getting this uh, comprehensive plan that Regis was talking about is so, so important. We have got to say New Mexico has the funds and it has to have the accountability so that we can move on and actually implement the, the visions. Um, you know, we have just as much potential as anyone. We don't want to be 50th anymore we won't stand for it. Um, well, yes. It, like you said, it's really our, our governor too. And uh, whether you like Governor Richardson or not, this isn't the point, but if you look at his policies, during his time, we had surplus money. And similar to how we're moving into this, um, you know, next year. And if you look a lot at a lot of his policies, and what he pushed through the state, they were very expensive. Um, the rail runner, which really doesn't create a profit, but we know public transportation doesn't really create profit. Um, the shuttle, we're still in debt for the shuttle. Maybe in 2040, we'll start seeing some profit come off of that. The movie industry, they made deals with the movie industry where we don't really make much of a profit off of that. Um, so because we have a surplus of money, we really have to implore our legislatures to invest um, in our communities and not in policies or in projects that aren't going to bring back to our community. Right, right. I'm, I'm going to um, broaden out a little bit, um, you know, to the whole country. I think in many ways, New Mexico is a model, um, even though we are at the bottom of every indicator. You know, if you look at kids count, you know, we look at child well-being and we look at education and all of these different things. In some ways, we're talking about the right issues. We're getting, I think, you know, we have consensus more on 
um, where we need to go and our failings. And there are lots of things that we need to improve. Um, on, you know, I, I just want to move out to uh, the larger picture about elections and um, wh what does, for instance, the idea of e pluribus unum mean to you? You know, we're, we're at a particularly polarized uh, time in our 245th year as a nation. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at possible decline of democracy. Uh, we're watching, you know, we're watching people uh, lose trust in our major institutions. Um, we've seen many, many eras where people disagreed, but they were able to like say, okay, people think differently and they didn't, it didn't end up in violence. And, um, and uh, you know, I think uh, we just brought up the idea of youth suicide and depression. We're seeing it in every ethnicity, not just native. You know, the, we have a responsibility to the youth to bring a better country. So how do, what is, you know, the concept of e pluribus unum mean to you? How do we um, work on getting people to move out of their bubbles and, uh, you know, use civil, uh, civil discourse in talking about policies that will help to make our country stronger and work on our common interests. How do we tone down the arguments? What have you done? I know all of us are teachers in, in certain ways, but what are we going to do um, with the threats against free speech, with, uh, you know, the threats against teaching our, frankly, our painful history. Um, so who wants to jump in on some of those huge topics? Mm. Meredith, I'm going to say that we have about 20 minutes left. So maybe this is the final question to the panelists and we can, and um, after they respond to your, this question, we can maybe open it up. Okay. Somebody started to talk. Was that Jenny? I'm well, just going to quickly I, say that because of the kind of systemic and institutional failures of our current education system, our leadership institute that is an indigenous think tank has really been forced to create our own programs um, to really talk about the truth of the history um, that impacts every facet of the life of indigenous peoples, their language, culture, uh, their homelands, their families, their communities, as a necessary tool to then engage in an intercultural kind of effort with other young people and really vest the well being of our collective future in the minds and hearts of young people. But that should have to be necessary, but it becomes necessary because the systems and institutions are failing society, generally speaking. And so it makes us or it forces us to respond in our own ways. But I just want to very quickly say that we're investing tremendous amounts of time and energy in creating programs for young people and from an intercultural perspective to really um, to, to really nurture the minds and hearts of young people and hope that their generations really will be a major contribution if we ask ourselves, what do we want most uh, that all future generations inherit from us? Um, you know, the core values of having love and respect and compassion at the center of that kind of contribution is our focus, but we, we have been compelled to respond, to invest our time and energy in young people. Thank you. Yes. Finney, were you gonna add something? Well, I was gonna point out that Dixie's had her hand up for a, a minute. Um, Dixie. Okay, Dixie. Oh yes, Dixie. Um, well, some of you know me and some of you don't, but I wanted to say that I really agree with 
this gentleman that just spoke, what's his name? Finney? Regis, Regis Pecos. No. Uh, anyway, when, when he was talking before, he was talking about making changes. Change and progress are one thing. But in my mind, they have nothing to do with equality. And so when we're setting our goals, we shouldn't emphasize so much on change and progress as we actually just come right out and say equality. Because I remember when I was living in New Mexico, which I did for 13 years, and I ran for office and we had a, a thing um, where they asked us questions. And the question was, what about you does nobody else know? And when I told them what none of them knew about me, they all kind of gasped because uh, they knew me as a person who, who thought everybody should be equal. And the thing that they didn't know about me was that I was the only white person in my father's family. The rest of them were all very dark complected because they were Cree Indian and the color held even after we got way past where the government wants to pay you. So making progress isn't enough. Making Having that as a, a ideal or a goal isn't enough. You should come right out and say what you want and uh, we should want equality. Yes, yes, absolutely. Finney, I'm coming back to you. Were you gonna say something else? Um, well, I, I mean, I haven't, I, I wanna answer your, the, the, the last question that we, we have. Um, it would take me the whole 20 minutes we have left to do it, uh, but, uh, <laughs> You know, take a stab. I'll take a stab. You know, so um, e pluribus unum, you, I mean, that comes from the poet Virgil. And in 1956, that no longer what became, uh, that no longer was the official motto of the United States. We moved from that to in God we trust. Oh. Um, and so e pluribus unum, you know, out of many one actually if you look there's some bloggers out there you'll find that it's actually the recipe for a salad right recipe for it it wasn't in his poetry it was in how you mash pesto together to make put all these different ingredients together to make this one in this one dish <laughs> um and so when we think about that when we go back to e pluribus unum that was first you know, Franklin Jefferson and one other person, I can't remember the third person, proposed that um, uh, to be on the national seal. And, but at the time, the three of them, out of many, one, they literally meant out of many European males who hold property, that all of them could come together to form one. When e pluribus unum went into effect, it did not include women, it did not include Native Americans, did not include blacks, right? It included the humanity that the founding fathers thought could come together to form a whole. And it's that fundamental um, understanding of our history that is at the root of some of the threats to our own um uh, progress with our children and teaching them. I know we don't want to talk about critical race theory today, um, but I want to get, if, if, when you're talking to someone and, and you're talking about critical race theory, most people in America have zero idea what it actually is, none. And if you tell, ask them, does it have five or six key tenets? And they say, oh, I don't know. Then you know that they don't know what the heck they're talking about. If you ask them about critical literary studies and which part of, of which are this 1970s critical legal studies or 1980s critical legal studies, and if they give you a blank stare, they don't know what critical race theory is about. If you say critical race philosophy and where does critical race theory fit into that, and their answer is, I have no idea, 
then don't listen to them. I'm watching these television ads and the like, talking about critical race theory. I watched this fella in Virginia lose an election because he was too arrogant to say that he had no idea that criti what critical race theory was. And so he couldn't counter the arguments that were being made against him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and say, for me, I teach the very best and the brightest young people in the state of New Mexico. And I'm really proud that they come to me with varying different um, levels of preparation, but that when we are, are genuine in our teaching, those young people, independent of where they come from, will rise up to the challenge and make that transition to what I call from making from being a student to becoming a scholar. I say that every chance that I can uh, to our students to make that transition. All of us, though, have to make that transition from simply accepting what we're told and doing the homework that it requires to actually figure things out so that we are an informed electorate. Uh, the, the most uh, malleable electorate is an uninformed electorate, right? Um, and that's where I think, you know, today's discussion, I think hopefully we can share this outside of this group of people that we have to become more informed about the issues that we're voting on. Right. Thank you, Dr. Absolutely, absolutely. You also have to remember that um, educators get a lot of pressure too. And I agree with you, Dr. Coleman, it, you know, it becomes more and more difficult in the classroom um, because they have moved education or certain institutions have moved to getting students out sooner and it's more ba skill-based um, versus critical thinking you know, uh, focusing on critical thinking. When I came through the university, we spent a lot of time on history and critical thinking. Now, you know, we're, we're pressured to just teach them skills and get them out of the classroom right. and get them out of the university as soon as possible so they're employable, uh, which is, you know, very problematic. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we have made some uh, significant step um, toward changing our social studies standards so that they include much more of our complex history. And uh, we know there's lots of reaction and people are running for school boards and saying, well, we don't need to follow these social studies standards. But I think it is so important that we start uh, insisting on civics education and, uh, you know, and and really having these hard topics. Um, I know that we're, we're you know, running uh, uh, tight on um, a lot of the time here. And I'm just wondering, do you think any of the conflict, we have so many crises that are hitting our country, but do you think like the conflict in Ukraine is helping to at least get people to think about democracy, you know, in a different way and, and you know, that that might, help to uh, make us look again at what we need to do in terms of having a strong democracy. You know, we look at the fire, forest fires and communities coming together and helping each other. There are some things that are these wake up calls and um, you know, how, what are we going to do? And that's really, you know, it's open-ended. It's not something where we are gonna be able to talk about all of that today. But uh, I think we have so many different comments coming in from the um, from the participants here that Meredith, I want to. Barbara, Excuse I think Barbara me? first. We have two people who are hands are raised, Barbara okay. and Irene. Um, I think Barbara was first. Okay. okay. I'm Barbara Chatterjee, and we've talked a lot about education and the sharing of information. And there's so much that we could discuss on so many fronts. But let me add one thing. It seems to me that our information media, i.e. the news sources, have truly failed us in getting real information to the public. After you're out of school, you've got to have another source that's reliable. And let's face it, whether we look at the PNM merger and Avangrid and all we get is sound bites, or we look at so many other things, we're not getting the in-depth information that we need repeated and repeated and repeated as we need it repeated. And I'll stop there. 
an excellent comment. Um, and I think all of us are concerned about the misinformation, the disinformation, the closing of a lot of independent um, media outlets. Uh, absolutely, we, we need to teach the media literacy in the schools so much. Um, who is next, Bethany? Uh, Irene. Hi, my name is Irene and I am actually a New Mexico listens person, but my sphere is just in Santa Fe County. First of all, the four of you are an awesome panel. One of the best that I've heard, I'm, on, I'm an expat, I've been back just almost three years now, one of the best I've heard in Santa Fe, so thank you to the four of you. You've raised all kinds of foundational core issues deeper than the, what I expected, which was going to be more along the lines of voting laws and that kind of thing. But I have a simple question. Um, it's a yes, no question, and then it has a little follow-up. It's built on the fact that you have so powerfully highlighted equity as a foundational issue. It's based also on the many years that I spent living out of the United States, where the United States is viewed perhaps not the way that we view ourselves all the time. Currently, there's a lot of concern about our democracy as fragile, as at extreme risk, and that shows up in some of our international relations. So as I try to digest everything you've talked about today, the yes, no question is, is it too late? Are we late getting to this party, to this issue, to this crisis? Are we so late that it's too late? Yes, no. And then I would like just a brief comment on why it is not too late or why you think, yes, maybe it is too late to all four panelists. Thank you. I'll say it's not too late. And the reason why is because of all of, because of, all of you and many others that you represent. Thank you. Thank you. Irene, thank you for your for the question. And I would say it is not too late um, because we have resilient communities and I think the power stands within them. And I think it's, it's in our power to come together as diverse people and diverse communities and unify all of that wisdom and all of that strength to continue fighting the fight because we all know, I mean, there's just no end to it. And I think if we unify, um, really that's, that's how we continue. Thank you for your question. I, that's an interesting question. I mean, I can really think about it that a lot, but I can only base it on what I see and what I kind of experience and in the classroom with students. And I think often that could be um, also uh, gendered, you know, and not only gender, but it, it goes along with a sense of privilege, you know, and and I have like a, a grandson that's eight, I have a granddaughter that's nine, and then I have one that's five. And my grandson, and I don't know if it's innate or if it's the way we behave around them, it, he just automatically assumes that he has more privilege than my granddaughters. And I'm always having to correct that and say, no, you know, we go back to equity. So. And I don't mean to define it by gender or age group or race and ethnicity, but I think it's our society and how we address females and males in our society. And I think if we could work on more equitable ways of addressing that in our society, I think we could achieve much more equity for our, our girls. Well, it looks like I'm going to be the outlier because I think it is not just too late now, um, but I think it has always been too late to do what we've always done. And that is to have the kinds of conversations that we're having about difference and about change, but not having everyone at the table when, you know, lesbian, gay, trans people are excluded from conversations, when people who are poor are excluded from conversations, when people who are black Latino, whatever uh, race or ethnic ethnicity is excluded from the conversation, 
then yes, it's too late. But it was too late before you got started. Um, it is not too late to bring those people together and to have honest and open conversations about where we need to go. As long as we continue on the path, on the path of what we think needs to be done, we're always going to be too late. Could I, could I just say one thing then? Um, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, what, what would be your thought on getting more people at the table? You have to go sit at their table. And we, if, if they're expected to come to our table, that requires some logistics that we often don't have culturally and socially. What we have to do, and this notion of equity and empathy, I know people go, what are you talking about? Empathy is one of the worst things that's ever happened in American society. Because what empathy does is it allows you to walk in someone else's shoes, but it doesn't force you to understand why in the world would anyone be forced to make that walk? That's what we need. We don't need empathy. We don't need sympathy. What we need is people of goodwill coming together and decentering themselves and what they think is the most important uh, thing and figuring out what other people need as opposed to what we uh, collectively, that's always been an exclusive we needs. Wow. Um, my gosh, uh, we are virtually out of time and I wanna thank all of you panelists and those of you who uh, uh, asked questions and we were monitoring the chats. Uh, I think you have definitely increased our understanding of the power of engagement and also the complexities of the major issues that are facing us. Um, I think so many people on this Zoom care deeply and are leading some of the efforts to empower our democracy and empower voters and non-voters alike. Uh, you know, and I, I thank you for your leadership. I thank you so much for helping us to influence policy so that we're making progress because I, I think, you know, we have, we can't give up. <laughs> we can't give up at this point. Um, I will also want to mention we're in the midst of our primary election. We know that we're soon facing one of the most consequential elections, uh, well, in 2022 midterms and also 2024. Um, we've got to get out the vote. I hope you'll encourage everyone not to give up, <laughs> to look for candidates who they think will best represent their, uh, their interests and the public interests. Um, I want to point you to the vote411.org, the voter guides that are available for all the communities in, in New Mexico and most uh, across the nation, voter, vote411.org, um, the League of Women Voters asks questions of candidates. So they, you can find out exactly where they say they stand on issues. Um, it's very important to everyone to keep on doing what you're doing, uh, protect our democracy. Thank you so much, Bethany, for uh, navigating uh, this, all the logistics today. And thank you, participants, and uh, fare ye well. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This recording will be on the internet um, after this, um, and we can send it out to all of you. Thanks for uh, attending. Mexico, thank you, Meredith. Thank you. NewMexicoHumanities.org. NewMexicoHumanities.org. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you all. And happy well, birthday. <laughs>